Sometimes you're just chilling at your computer. One minute you're on YouTube, watching reviews, not a care in the world. Then some guy from Glasgow comes along, says he's gonna review point-and-click adventure games. Next thing you know, you find yourself subscribed to his channel. He's pretty good, but then you notice there's one game in particular he never talked about. And when you sit there in stunned silence, there's only one way out, and it usually starts with a lot of shouting. Eki Fu! Hey! I'm talking to you! Hmm? Oh, the great mystical internet reviewer hijack. Yeah, I should have known this would happen eventually. So, what can I do for you, Mr. I'm a Yiro Takago of the Akago Dojo? Eki Fu, you're dumber than dirt. Get with the times. I quit that dojo thing years ago. Now, it's just me. But never mind all that. I came here to address a grave injustice on your part. Oh god, is this about Discworld again? Discworld? Fuck no, I hate that game. No, you claim to be an expert on all things point and click like, yet you never reviewed one of my all time favorite games. A classic that continues to be adored by a great many today, and that deserves the attention of many more to come. Limbo of the Lost? Yes. I mean, no, dang it! Full throttle! Why have you not yet reviewed Full Throttle, man? Full f What am I going to say about Full Throttle? Everybody knows it's good. It's a LucasArts point and click game. That doesn't go wrong. That didn't stop you from reviewing Fate of Atlantis either, now did it? Besides, it's not just good, it's awesome. Oh, but Fate of Atlantis was less well known. It had interesting things like the multiple paths for puzzles. It was a good licensed game for once. I Hang on, if that's your argument, how come you haven't reviewed Full Throttle yet? Touché, Fifth Musketeer. Then I propose that the two of us join forces and show the good people of the internet out there just how awesome it really is. For great justice! What do you say? You're not going to turn this hijack off until I do, are you? Not even a little bit. For great justice, then! Full Throttle was released in 1995 and fell straight out of the brain of Tim Schafer. With three co-designer credits on well-received games under his belt already, Mr Schafer was arguably more than qualified to take on design duties by himself. Set in an unexplained dystopian future of Sand and Brown, Full Throttle follows motorbicyclist Ben. Just Ben. He was going to be called Ben Throttle, but they left out his last name for fear of lawsuits from the creators of Biker Mice from Mars. Yeesh. And there's a 90s property I wish I could forget about. Already have. Ben starts off quietly recounting the events of the game, making it essentially one big flashback, told with the gravelly tones of the now sadly departed Roy Conrad. It starts with these guys. Malcolm Corley, the elderly CEO of Corley Motors and a man not known for taking or giving shits, accompanied by a sinister, long-faced vice president, Adrian Ripburger, who's voiced by the one and only Luke Skywalker, Joker and Fire Lord Ozai himself, Mark Hamill. And Colonel Christopher Blair and Wing Commander, not to mention Detective Mosley and Gabriel Knight. Ah, some PC gaming credit you have. So you're telling me you've beaten all the Wing Commander games? Uh, so the Corley Motors crew are on their way to the company shareholders meeting and en route they discuss business and how much of a wanker Rip Burger is. No, really, this happens right to his face. It's awesome. While that's going on, Ben and his badass biker gang known as the Polecats appear in the distance and speed past the hovering limo, with Ben himself making a show of jumping over the car and crushing the poor little hood ornament. You ridiculously kick-ass intro song which we can't play here because we get a copyright notice. The gang makes it to a biker bar called The Kickstand where Corley and co catch up with them. Old Corley heads in first and the minions ponder his horrible fate at the hands of the greasy bikers. <laughs> but Malcolm, isn't that illegal? Not back then it wasn't. <laughs> Rip Burger then steps in to speed up what he calls the sales pitch. Since Corley Motors is the last motorcycle manufacturer in America, they'll take part in a PR stunt where the polecats escort Corley to the shareholders' meeting, for which Rip Burger promises them significant compensation. Ben isn't interested, but goes to have a private chat with Rip Burger once it's let slip that old Corley might be kicking the bucket soon. It's a trap! Wait, so that doesn't get us a copyright strike? Shut up, they might not notice. Right, 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 right. Sure enough, Ben is knocked over the head by Rip Burger's goon squad, Nestor and Bolas. Voiced by Maurice LaMarche, aka The Brain, and Jack Angel, aka every incidental character from every cartoon ever. The gang is led to believe that Ben went ahead of them while he's in fact been unceremoniously left to rot in a dumpster. 
The game then begins as you make Ben punch his way out, seething with furious hatred for all suit-wearing executives. And a little bit of hatred for dumpsters. Take that. Now, the interface for Full Throttle... Oh, 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 back off. Game design is my thing, okay? Watch the big man at work. I've more subscribers than you This was have. the first LucasArts adventure to implement the medallion interface. Clicking and holding in the left mouse button brings up this thing, from which you can choose to fist, boot, eye or mouth whatever it is you clicked on. Adventure games were, at this point, pretty much all heading towards a full screen interface, leaving nothing but a cursor in the way of the graphical prettiness, and I guess you could call this a stopgap to the two-button interface we're seeing today. The only other time LucasArts used the medallion interface was in the Curse of Monkey Island. The less said about the control scheme they adopted after that, the better. The thing that annoys me about the medallion is that it takes half a second to appear and then you need to nudge the mouse over to the right action and let it go before it'll do what you want. I get why they wanted to move away from a big list of verbs, but why they would choose to abandon keyboard shortcuts after all this time is frankly a little bit bad. Uh, actually, the game does have keyboard shortcuts. See? It's also right here in the manual. In Dutch, yeah, but it's there. You dummy. Verhoeven Dominoganto. You might assume that the boot icon would just make Ben walk everywhere, but it's actually to use Ben's foot on the things. Things like the first door you come across. Seems like they were deliberately going for an action focus with this game. Example, the bartender won't tell you where your gang went. Most point and click protagonists are meek or at the very least unskilled in causing harm, necessitating that they dupe, hoodwink or trap their more physically intimidating opponents. Ben has a different approach. You know what might look better on your nose? What? The bar. Man, how often I wish I could have pulled this on my brother when I was younger. Needless to say, this gets Ben the information he needs as well as the keys to his bike. So, he gloriously blasts off on his apparently jet-powered flame streaming motorcycle to catch up with his gang. And here's where we're introduced to the combat. Yes, the bane of every adventure gamer, the obligatory out-of-place arcade sequence. But really, it's not that bad here, in my humble opinion. You just click a lot until your opponent falls down. Unless your opponent ends up clicking harder and faster, in which case you'll have to resort to more devious methods. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. With the fight over, Ben pulls a victorious wheelie, only to find that his front wheel isn't as securely fastened as he thought. It makes an escape, causing Ben to actually show an emotion. He tries to keep the wheelie up as long as he can, but eventually the forks of the bike slam down onto the road, sparks and fire happen all over the place, and he crashes. That would have been quite the blaze of glory to go out in, but even Full Throttle ain't that sure. Ben wakes up just long enough to hear some camera clicks before falling back unconscious. When he finally wakes up properly, he sees a very different face altogether. What are you? And he asks what anyone who woke up to a strange face in a strange place would ask. What have you done with my bike? The strange face belongs to Marine, or Mo for short. A mechanic who's been fixing up Ben's pride and joy while he recuperates. She's not finished yet, and without Ben's help, she won't finish anytime soon. Long story short, you go about the town, called Melonweed, trying to find the parts that she needs, namely her stolen welding torch, a new pair of front forks, and some gas. We naturally do this by talking to all the friendly folks who are more than willing to help you, like the junkyard owner, Todd, some policemen on a hover skiff who are guarding a local gas tower, and Todd's dog who keeps the junkyard safe from would-be looters. Now is probably as good a time as any to talk about how the game looks. In a single word, fantastic. In approximately 227 words, they put in a lot of effort. When I think about the graphics of point and click games, I think of all the repeated stuff. Walk cycles, talking animations, things like that. Animations which are used more than once in different situations. Then Full Throttle swans in looking like it has unique animations for damn near everything. Now obviously that's not the case, but I doubt it's far off. Pretty much any chance it has to throw in a full screen piece of animation, it'll do so. Something that was normally reserved for big cutscenes or sometimes just the intro. The gas tower in Melonweed is a great example, where Ben practically turns into a silhouette under the tower's floodlights. Think about that for a second. Someone thought it would be a good idea to redo all of Ben's walking and talking artwork just so it would match up to the stark shadows of the scene. Then they went ahead and actually did it. And they also did this, which I will happily watch on loop for about an hour. I can see why they waited until the advent of CD-ROM to do this kind of game, because all those extra graphics and the fully voiced cast, I wouldn't fancy installing this off of 340 floppy disks. And that's before you consider the amount of full motion video they used. The game borrowed code from the insane engine used in the Rebel Assault games to have FMV playing in a fully interactive setting. 
Not like the fully filmed grid movement of Temujin or something like that. More along the lines of rendering normal graphics on a video background, like in a rail shooter, such as Rebel Assault for example. Up until this point in the story, it's mostly just been used to straight up play video and cutscenes, but they find a different use for it very soon. I definitely hear you about this game's graphics. Despite being rather low res, it still looks pretty good overall, even with some obvious instances of early 90s CGI. Either way, the game really has a distinct art style to it, full of all the stuff that Tim Schafer loves. We got some kick-ass heavy metal bikers, gorgeous desert landscapes, cool vehicles, sexy women... Well, maybe not Susie, unless you're into that sort of thing. But definitely Mo. I mean, that voice. Well, Kath Susie's no Jennifer Hale in the voice department, but she's still pretty saucy. Anyway, with the bike fixed and no time to spare, Ben races off to meet up with his gang just outside of town. Right as Red Burger brutally beats Corley over the head and leaves him to die in a pool of his own blood. Ben finds him just too late and swears to get revenge. Just before Corley shuffles off the mortal coil, he asks Ben to find his illegitimate daughter and heir to the company. Find my daughter, Ben! Find Marine! You know, there's actually a wee bonus in here for anyone who replays the game or has a photographic memory of Ben and Moe's first meeting. But I don't have the official paperwork. Ah. An illegitimate Corley operation. Huh, I never even realized that little connection. Nice catch. But now Ribberger wants her dead, Ben takes the rap for Corley's murder, and his gang goes to jail. So, you've got your work cut out for you. Clear Ben's name, win back most trust, since her father's death has gone and got her a bit grumpy, fight back against several rival biker gangs, and of course, stop Ribberger from making Corley Motors churn out... minivans. Ugh. As you can tell, the game is structured in a relatively linear fashion, progressing from one location to the next by fulfilling a number of tasks and going through all the usual adventure game malarkey along the way. You go from the kickstand, to melonweed, to bopping up and down the old mine road, and finally to the Corley Motors headquarters in the eponymous Corville for the final confrontation with Ribberger. But that's about as much as we can talk about without getting into serious spoiler territory. Though there are some parts that I feel need to be elaborated on, particularly the aforementioned old mine road. This section can go on for quite a long time as you do nothing but fight several rival bikers one after another on the same stretch of road, all in order to obtain a few MacGuffins that you need to move on. In effect, this sequence is something of a long puzzle as you continuously obtain new and better weapons that can take down certain enemies with whom your bare knuckles won't suffice. Unfortunately, given that enemies appear in a random order, it can take quite a while of mowing down several other minor unimportant goons before you get to the one you need. And that's assuming you even know what to do against him or her. And this is the part of the game where we see the insane engine really working its magic. The old mine road is one long winding track with several exits onto the main highway and in fact crosses over said highway twice. You view Ben's bike from behind as he rides and the engine essentially plays a video with the bike painted on top. Not too fancy except you can take the exits to the highway as you pass them and the game immediately switches over to the new video animation. You can also move Ben left and right but for what purpose I have no idea. Just to add interactivity or to stop you falling asleep between fights? Oh come on guys, if you're taking ideas from Desert Bust, you're doing it fucking wrong. The other problem I have is that it makes you drive along until you come across somebody to pummel. You can press escape to skip a section, but if there's another bike in view or about to become visible, they magically disappear. So skipping sections could in fact make it take longer to find someone if you're not careful. This is still a point and click game, and the fact that you essentially have to wait around and hope you get lucky, in my humble dignified opinion, is a bit poop. They do get some points back for including Maniac Mansion's Razor among your opponents. Plus it never gets old to see them violently crash against the asphalt after a single swipe from your roaring red chainsaw of death! Okay, yeah, that is pretty satisfying. Stupid punchy bike peoples. Fortunately, there's no fear of dying here either. The only thing that happens if you lose a fight is that you eat dirt the same way as your opponents, after which Ben just shakes it off and moves on like the badass that he is. Although some opponents have different standards. That's another weird one. LucasArts traditionally had a policy of no deaths, no game overs. This isn't invoked often, but there's a few points near the end where Ben can in fact snuff it. Even then, it just boots you back to the start of the scene and lets you try again. And also worthy of note, even if you can't die in it, is the Demolition Derby, which can be tricky to figure out since it's not so much about action, but you just kind of drive around aimlessly until you figure out what to do, so yeah, trial and error. That's fun. And the person who made this mouse controlled should be punched in the junk. Except you can still use the keyboard for that as well, Mr. I'm too good to read manuals. 
Does that make the sequence any easier to complete? Let's put the action bits aside for the moment and talk about the puzzles. They're pretty straightforward most of the time, with basic inventory puzzles like use lockpick on padlock, but there's some more creative stuff that stands out as well, such as operating a magnetic crane, or crossing a minefield by using a box full of battery-operated yellow bunnies, while merrily hop along to Richard Wagner. Plus, as mentioned, there's plenty of opportunities for Ben to use a more hands-on approach than you'd normally expect from this genre, which is always nicely cathartic. Unfortunately, there's one puzzle near the end that can really get on your nerves even if you do know the solution, namely kicking this wall in the exact right spot to open a hidden passage. Not only do you have to pinpoint precisely which spot on the wall to kick, but you have to do it at the exact right moment when the clicking meter stops for a second, and the delay between telling Ben where to go and then have him walk over there and kick can throw off your timing a bit. Quite right, there's far too much guesswork that goes into solving that one, and you don't get so much as the right place wrong timing comment to coax you along, it's hold down, select boot, watch failure animation, move, times infinity, bringing everything to a grinding halt when you're within spunking distance of the game's climax. But the thing that really stands out about this game, to me at least, is just how freaking cool it is. Right from the very first scene of Ben and his gang riding along the desert road, you're drawn along into this awesome world that wouldn't be out of place on a heavy metal album cover. As opposed to that other Tim Schafer game which is literally based on heavy metal album covers? Yeah, that's pretty awesome too, but I haven't actually played that one yet. Helping with this game's badassitude is the kick-ass licensed music, performed by rock band The Gone Jackals, which lends itself very well to Ben's road adventure, with heavy guitar riffs and percussion neatly adding that extra bit of oomph to the action. Whether you're riding around in your awesome motorcycle, watching shit blow up, or beating the crap out of some of the friendly folks you meet on the road. But above all else, the climax of this game, which of course we're not showing here, has to be one of the most glorious things I've ever witnessed, with the tension constantly rising as you're thrust into danger at high speeds, forcing you to think fast to save Ben's skin along with everyone else's, all while making sure that Rip Burger goes down for good. Ben himself also is one of my favorite video game protagonists of all time. Hell, I wanted to be this guy when I was a kid. Yes, I was lonely and pathetic. Shut up. Oh, no, don't. I'm... I'm sure you weren't lonely. But seriously, Ben's a free spirit who goes where he pleases, doesn't take crap from anybody, and anyone who gets in the way of him or the ones he cares about had better beware because he will make you regret it. But he's not just dumb muscle, he still manages to put his grey matter to work as well. He's just a bit more pragmatic than most adventure game protagonists. As Tim Schafer himself once put it, if Bernard from Day of the Tentacle were faced with a locked door while he was carrying a sandwich, he'd go through some convoluted means to cleverly use the sandwich's ingredients to unlock the door. Ben, on the other hand, would just eat the sandwich and kick down the door. Speaking of which, there is actually a cut bit of dialogue where Ben reveals his full name is Reuben, and that his dad named all of his kids after sandwiches. So, does that make Hoagie from Day of the Tentacle Ben's brother? Food for thought, wink wink. And if you want to add a character flaw into the mix, there's this sequence with a reporter who saved Ben's life after his bike crash. With his bike still out of commission, Ben has to do something he's almost physically incapable of. Asking for a ride... in a car! This is hard for me, I... I need... Come on, man, spit it out! Could you give me a ride in your car? Oh, the complete and utter anguish! You know what? I last played this a good few years ago, before I started reviewing anything. I don't know if I wasn't paying attention or what, but I had it in my head that Full Throttle was about as good as any other LucasArts adventure. Kinda cool, bit sharp, not world changing, just not bad. I was wrong, dumb and very, very wrong. This was LucasArts making what they arguably did best, pouring time and effort into creating a gorgeous, dare we say, cinematic experience. From interface to graphics to characters to the use of professional voice actors, they wanted something unique and they damn well did it. Not a bad send-off for the Scum Engine and the traditional point-and-click adventure in general. Or it would have been if the dig hadn't come out afterwards, but that's another story. In any case, the short length of the game was mostly because they cut out a lot of the filler crap that most games left in. When you're in Melonweed and you obtain a bike part, it cuts back to Mo in her garage. You don't need to see Ben drag a giant pair of forks across the town, you just accept that he's done it. I couldn't agree more. This game, while short overall, is most definitely one of the sweetest things I've ever experienced in video gaming. Style, the cool factor, the music, the cinematic quality, the voice acting, everything just comes together so well that I can replay this over and over again and never get tired of it. It is, without a doubt, one of my all-time greatest point-and-click adventures and one of my definitive games of the 1990s, alongside such other prolific titles as The Neverhood, Another World, and Doom. 
especially Doom. Hey, Iggy. Doom was pretty awesome, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I loved Doom. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I love Doom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Doom was pretty awesome. What's so funny? I'm just talking about Doom. <laughs> oh, fuck's sake. Uh, totally worth it. Turn that fucking hijack off. The population is greatly decreased. And now the odds are greatly increased. That I may someday get a chance to kiss your lips. I thank the Lord each day for the apocalypse. Folks are mostly disfigured or dead, but sugar, I won't let it go to my head. My mama's face has dripped down into the dirt, but I'm still chasing Chitlin's whiskey and skirt.